Well, good afternoon. It's uh, 12.23 on the 27th, uh, Wednesday, the 27th of September, 2017. It's supposed to be Calculus 3 class. We were supposed to start at 12.15, but I came to the room. Nobody was here. I went down to the hall to wash my hands and that kind of stuff. Came back. Still nobody here, so I thought, well, let's go on and get started. Um, <clears throat> my... Uh, did want to make a couple of announcements before I go too much further. Just to let you know, I don't know if any of you would be looking or anything, but my office hours for the next few days are going to be a little weird, okay? I can't remember if I told you this. I think I did. You know, I'm pretty sure I have. Uh, my office hours on Mondays and Wednesdays typically have been 3.15 to 5.15. But ever since we started doing the math team, then uh, they have sort of shifted because when the math team has met, it's been 3.15 till sometime around five, uh, 4.45. Now, we've only met, I think, one day, so it hasn't really influenced them that much. But today, I've got another issue. Several weeks ago, Dr. Uh, Thomas asked me to cover a... Uh, Statistics test for this evening uh, from 3.30 until 4.45. Now, that was before I knew I was going to be doing the math team. So I said, sure, I could do it because I, that was my office hours. So I'm doing that today. So whether we have math team or not, I'm not going to be able to, to do math team except maybe 15 minutes at the most, but probably not even that. Um, and then I've got to go practice the test. Now, they may finish early, so if people want to come in after that, that'll be fine. But if not, then I'll be in the office hours after that. But I will be back in the office from 4.45 until 5.15 at least. I can stay a little later today, I think. I don't have any pressing need that I need to go home, so I might uh, stay a little bit later than uh, 5.15. <clears throat> but that's uh, my problem today. Uh, at 3.30, I've got to proctor a test. And it may go to a 445 or not, whenever it goes. But that's going to be down in 263. So if you do need to see me, uh, that's where I'll be. Tomorrow, everything is fairly close to normal, <clears throat> as far as I know. And then uh, Friday, normally I'm on the Birmingham campus, 745 to 1145 in the morning. But... Uh, Friday, I won't be there because I've got an infusion Friday, and I'll be at the Kirkland Clinic sometime seven-ish or so, sometime after seven probably, and the infusion starts at eight-ish or so, and then they usually go until close to four or later sometimes. So I won't be at on campus at all Friday. Monday should be a fairly normal day. I hope we'll do math team uh, at 3.15 to uh, 445, then I'll be in the office from 445 to uh, 515 or later. <clears throat> Actually, I don't think I'll be much later on Monday because I think we have something I have to do on Monday. But then uh, Tuesday, my only office hours typically are 1215 to 115. On Tuesday, I'm taking my fiscal science class on a field trip. And I'll need to go over and pick up a van at the Birmingham campus, so I'm going to have to leave right at 12.15, uh, race over there and get the van, get back here in time to pick them up at 1.15 and go to the field trip. So my office hours are shot on Tuesday <clears throat> from uh, the 12.15 to 1.15. I'll be on the road just about the entire hour. After that, I think things get more normal. Okay, at least until second mini term begins, and then actually I get a few more office hours than what I have now. So anyway, we'll go from there. Okay, um, I don't. I think we were starting at the beginning of thirteen three. Uh, still nobody's here, so we'll go on. <coughs> Sorry. Um, in thirteen three. I think we just sort of started talking about it a little bit. Um, back in section 11.2, which I think we went through fairly rapidly at the beginning of the, this uh, term, 
we derived the formula for arc length on a plane curve given the parametric form, given in parametric form. Now we're going to extend that to three space, and it really has very few changes in it. Uh, but one of the big changes is you refer to it as a vector rather than an equation. Okay? So if we have, let me see if I can get my pen set up. Here we go, and I think maybe I have a student coming in. Yes, okay. I was afraid I'd be talking to myself the whole time. Okay. Now. Wednesday uh, the 27th. Jasmine's here. All right. Afraid I've got sort of some bad news. I announced this before, but you weren't in here yet. Were you planning to stay for math lab today, a math team today? No, I, I okay, okay. It actually works out okay with me too because weeks ago, before I knew we'd be doing math team now, Dr. Thomas had asked me to proctor an exam for today from 3:30 until 4:45, and I thought, you know, she reminded me of that yesterday, the day before, whenever. Oh, there goes the math team practice. But if you've already, okay. So that'll work out well for both of us. So. Okay. All right. We were just starting. I was just, uh, let me see. Were you going to need to be trying to find me during office hours either today? Probably not, because you got a dentist appointment. Uh, Friday or Tuesday? Okay. Um, I put all that on there so you can listen to it if you want to. I won't go into that again. It won't be 315, it'll be 445 to 515, but I can say later if I need to. Okay, now, <clears throat> I thought that turned on. It does this sometimes. I touch the button and nothing happens. I guess I should press the button, punching maybe too uh, violent, I don't know. Okay, we're in 13.3, page 706, arc length and speed. Okay, I'm waiting for the projector to come on a little brighter. And I was just saying that I think we did at the first week or so of the term, went through quickly some of the sections in 11 and 12, and in 11.2, there was an arc length formula in two dimensions. Now we're in three dimensions, and actually I didn't mean to do that. In three dimensions, of course, now we also refer to it in vector because this is vector value functions is what we're dealing with here. So R, as a function of the parameter T, is uh, X of T, Y of T, Z of T. Now, we say that, what this is meaning is, <clears throat> this is a vector, okay, R is a vector. The components of the vector are scalar functions. R of t is a vector function, but its components are all scalar functions. And we know how to deal with scalar functions, derivatives and integrations and that kind of stuff. We've been doing that, okay? But if this is this, uh, and this just means that whatever you're, doing on x if it's following some function, y is following some function, z is following some function, that function that you have then is a vector value function. Okay, now we choose a partition, oh yeah, and this is going, this is good from a less than or equal to t less than or equal to b. So your, your, your parameter now, we always think of it as time. It doesn't have to be time. It could be something else. But whatever that parameter is, uh, it has beginning and end. Beginning at A, ending at B. Okay? Now, 
You can choose a partition of that uh, from A then to A plus A plus 1, A plus 2, A plus 3, A plus 4, A plus 5, A plus 6, all the way up to B, where the numbers there represented the thickness of your partition, how, how big that partition is. Um, and I guess we should have done yeah, the way the book did. They named A to be T sub 0, and then the next T was T sub 1, the next T was T sub 2, the next one was T sub 3, T sub all the way up. So the last T was T sub the other, is, is B, T is equal to B. So this is partition in T, okay? Split that into as many increments as you want, okay? Now, um, so the initial point is at R of A, terminal point at R of B. And this is a three-dimensional curve, could be going anywhere there. Now, <clears throat> what they show here, what we're gunning for, is what's the length of this arc. Okay. Now, especially if that arc is starting here somewhere and going up here and doing this kind of motion, that's a tough thing to calculate the length of that arc. You'd have to have a flexible <laughs> uh, measure and, and, and follow along there. We'll calculate it. Calculus can do it for us. And what we're going to do is start with this approximation, okay? A linear approximation from R A, R of T sub 0 to R of T sub 1. Another one to T2, one to T3, another one to T4, T5, all the way to B. Now that's going to underestimate the length of the arc, but it's going to be a decent approximation. Of course, how you make it better? Make the increments even smaller, the partitioning closer together. So you have more T subs, okay, and uh, and you get closer and closer to that approximation. All right. Now, so in other words, let your T sub I minus T sub I minus 1 approach 0. In other words, your delta T is approaching 0. And then it becomes a DT. Well, what does that produce? This is, produces as your path. Length of a path, or arc length, is another word for it. Uh, <coughs> path length, arc length, length of a path. Assume that R is differentiable. <coughs> now, remember what that means. R is x of t, y of t, z of t. That means that x of t is differentiable, the y of t is differentiable, and z of t is differentiable, all in that range of t's, okay? that they are all continuous, smooth, those kinds of functions, so they're differential. Now, let's also assume that R prime of T is continuous. So the R is differentiable, R prime is continuous. It may not be differentiable, but it is continuous on A to B, both of those. Then the length S of the path of R of T for A less than or equal to T less than or equal to B would be then this arc length. And S is usually the symbol for arc length. It's the integral from A to B of those okay. they have sort of skipped a bunch of steps here and throw that at you. It's the magnitude of R prime of T times dt. And you think where did that come from, okay? We haven't done anything to lead us to that until you look at this. Well, well, what is the magnitude of R prime of T? That would be the square root of X prime of T plus Y X prime of T squared. Now, I don't like putting the square there. It almost looks like it's T squared. It's not. It's X prime squared. So I would put the square there, but that would be a little confusing too. But <coughs> But this is that. Now, hopefully this makes a little more sense uh, because, I'm not sure if it does or not, uh, <coughs> I 
Well. Think of it this way. Okay? S is a length. Okay? R is a length. Right? R is a linear thing. It's a linear function. If you take the derivative of R, you get a slope. Right? Okay. Um, but now, I, I just was arguing against this, but now I'm going to say, let's go for it. If you think of R as a displacement and R prime as being your velocity, right? Velocity times time is distance, right? Traveling 60 miles an hour, that's your velocity. Travel three hours, you go 180 miles. That's the distance, okay? Well, think of this. This is now kind of like this velocity function, right? R prime. Except it's a speed function, so you don't have the direction issue to deal with, okay? So this is your speed times time that gives you distance. Yeah, okay, now that's sort of making a little more sense. And then if you do that and say, well, then what is R prime of t? The magnitude of that is the square root of x prime of t squared. And again, I like to put the square root there. Plus y prime squared plus z prime squared times dt. Okay? Now, that's something we can handle. Okay? Because... R is some function of scalar functions, right? And the magnitude of the scalar function, the derivative, the first derivative of that scalar function, and remember we said that R of t was differentiable, so all these are differentiable, and then we're going to square those, add them together, take a square root, and then whatever that function is, we're going to integrate from t, uh, with respect to t, from a to b. Okay? So there's your arc length point. Yay, okay, an arc length formula. Is that easy to do? Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> you come up with a function, a, a vector function, that just happens to be when you take the first derivative of the x component, square it, and the y component, square it, and the z component, square it, and add them all together, and then take a square root. If that's something you can do, Good luck with that, okay, <laughs> because that's a very special function that all that is, would be something that you could integrate with any ease whatsoever. So this is theoretically, it's absolutely true, but practically it's very hard to come up with things that you can do. You wind up doing numerical integration because it's so terribly miserable to do. But guess what? They've come up with a few that we can do, and let's do what? Let's do example one. Find the arc length S of the helix given by R of T is equal to cosine 3T sine 3T I think it is, but I've lost it there. No, 3t. Okay, 3t. Okay. As long as t is between 0 and 2 pi. So basically, well, it's not even one period. It's three periods, I think. Uh, yeah, three periods of your trig functions there. All right, so. Uh, so anyway, we need to do that. All right. Now, since we've given everything here, all we have to do is plug it in this formula down here. Uh, let's see. Find the arc length S. So S is equal to the integral. Your A to B here is 0 to 2 pi, right? your t, integrating with respect to t, so t is going from 0 to 2 pi, and then here we have the square root of, what's your x of t? 
the cosine three t. So we got to take a derivative of that, and that would be what? Derivative of that. X prime is what? Negative three sine three t. Okay. Your y prime as a function of t is. 3 cosine 3t, three okay, all right, and your derivative of your z function there is equal to what? Three. 3, just 3, okay, so we take those three things and square them, okay, so the first one will be 9 times sine squared 3t, right, plus, what's the next one? 9 times cosine squared 3t plus 9. Okay. <clears throat> All right. The good news here is this is the integral from 0 to 2 pi. Uh, what can you, what's the one thing you note about that square root there? Okay. Uh, there is an identity in there, but the first thing to note here, factor out common factors. Is there a common factor? Nine. And that's a perfect square, too, isn't it? Good for us. Okay. So that's going to be, you factor out a square root of nine, which is three. Well, let's pull that all the way outside the integral then, right? Okay, and what's left then? The square root of? Plus cosine squared 3t. There's your identity. What's that? 1, okay, plus 1, right? Because you factored 9 out of the 9, and you left a 1. So guess what you got there? Square root of 2. You can factor that out, too. So this is 3 root 2, the integral from 0 to 2 pi of dt. And what's that? Antiderivative of dt is t. Okay. And t evaluated, so 3 root 2 of t evaluated from 0 to 2 pi. And what would that be? Yep, which is just 2 pi. So that would be 6 pi root 2, or 6 root 2 pi, I guess that's what, 6 root 2 pi, or something like that, however you want to write it. That's the integral of that. Now, it worked out nicely because, like you said, there was an identity in there, and there was a perfect square you could factor out. Let's see, there it is, 6 root 2 pi. That's what they got, and that's even how they wrote it. Okay. Now, they had to really scratch around to get something that <laughs> you could deal with, okay? And that was quite doable. Okay. Now, if you remember back the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, Part 2. This is a definite integral, okay, when you have one that's on the t's, right? Well, now they did this in Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, Part 2. If you want to make this function dependent on, say, a parameter, and they happen to use the same one t, which is a little bizarre, but it's okay. Uh, then what they do is take this, make it a function of, well, I think they actually said x, and then you keep the lower limit here, a, okay, and put instead of, instead of uh, b up here, you put x, and then leave these in terms of t, or if you wanted that in terms of t, 
make this something else in terms of S or something like, like that. But that would then be how we change that from a fixed arc length to an arc length function. Okay? And that's what we're talking about here. This is that arc length function, except they didn't. They chose the, the easier to write form, but the form is really hard to do. Uh, and they said S is a function of T. I thought they might be X. So they said S of T. So instead of putting a B up here, they make it the integral from A to T of that here. But since they're using T as the limit here of the integral, they change this. That, it's just a dummy thing anyway, because you're going to evaluate it out. So make it R prime of U du, R prime of S dx. It doesn't matter what you name it, just don't have the T nor A either, because or S, those would be sort of R, those would be silly things to put there, but any other letter, like U. Okay, and if you put that in terms of the square root of X and Y and Z's, then that would be the square root of X prime squared plus Y prime squared plus C prime squared, but each of those are functions of that dummy variable, U or S or, or whatever you want it to be. Um, D, U, or D, S, whatever. Okay? So that's how you change it from calculating a heart arc length to coming up with an arc length function of your variable. Uh, and they keep talking about speed, and if it is talking about speed, then that's probably is time as a function of time. So, if you go one more step, okay, and you take the derivative of this, derivative of arc length would be the speed along which you're traveling that path, right? That's what the derivative would tell you, that is time. Well, if you take a derivative of an integral, you wind up what's inside because derivation, derivatives of integrals undo each other. They're inverse operators, you might say. And so you wind up with r prime of t or whatever you want to name the variable. Well, guess what? In fact, you would need to. Isn't the speed, which that would be, derivative of arc length with respect to time, that would be the magnitude of your velocity. You've had physics, right? Okay? That's what speed is, the magnitude of the velocity. And that is exactly what we get here. The speed at any time t, as you're going along a path, an arc length, is ds dt, and that basically comes out being r prime of t, the magnitude of r prime of t. In other words, the absolute value of that r prime of t. Though magnitude is a little more involved than absolute value, but it has the same kind of connotation. Okay? Uh, all right. Now, they also say a couple of things here. Uh, let me do that. Remember, your displacement vector is R of T, right? Okay. Your distance would be the arc length, okay? S. And if that's a function of time, that would be S of t. So this is a, a vector that's the scalar corresponding to it, okay? Well, dr dt, if that is indeed a displacement function, this is your velocity function. First derivative of displacement is velocity from physics too, right? Okay. Well, the first derivative of arc length, ds dt, is speed, which is the magnitude of your velocity function, which we normally say the magnitude of the r prime, which is your velocity function. And now, what they say in the book 
velocity, then they quite often, they write it bold. I can't write bold, so I put that. And if it's speed, they write it as a uh, italicized script V. Not vector V, but italicized. So that stands for speed, that stands for velocity. Velocity of scalar quantity, speed of vector, uh, I'm sorry. Velocity of vector quantity, speed of scalar quantity. V, V, S, S, <laughs> you know, velocity vector, speed scalar. Okay, so let's do example two. And I'm trying to think if this next figure relates. I don't think it is. But let's just show it. Uh, this has not got to do with example two. I thought maybe it did, but now that I look at it, I don't think it has anything to do with it. I'll read the problem and see. Okay. Here's your path. The pink is your path here, your pathway because that is the arc length, okay? Now, at R of T0, you're not down here, you have to be right there. Your R prime at T0 is going to be your tangent vector at T0, which is going to be your speed there. And your speed is in the direction of the tangential motion, okay? Tangential motion, tangential motion. Then at some T1 a little bit later, the R is going from here to here, and since R1 is longer than R, and RT1 is longer than RT0, that means you're speeding up, okay? So your velocity here must have been fairly positive. However, uh, if you, now, again, you can't tell dimensions on this. Uh, this R can be sticking into the board here and look short, but actually be quite long. This one could be flat on the board, look longer, but actually not be as long. But here in RT1, the velocity vector is there. Now you see this curve may be out here in space. It's not on the ZY plane or any of the other planes. It's coming out of the board this way, and so your velocity is along that curve. So the velocity vector is longer at T0 than it is at T1. So they're saying what we saw was right, indicating the particles moving faster at T0, and because it did, the displacement got longer, but it's slower here, so the odds are the next T is actually, it looks like it's going to be longer, but uh, actually it's still a positive velocity, so it still is getting a little long. It's just not getting as much longer at a faster rate as it did here to here. It's still going to so, I don't know. That's the most I can get out of the uh, slide, but again, it's very hard to get too much, interpret too much of what's supposed to be a three-dimensional motion looking at just two dimensions. It's really hard to see. So let's do example two. There is no graph for it, so let's do it on this one. Find the speed at time t equal two seconds of a particle and that'll be measured in seconds, by the way, of a particle whose position is R of T is equal to T cubed I minus E to the TJ plus 4TK. Okay, now, if, if I haven't told you before, let me now, in the book, they just bold the i, j, and k. And for most vectors, when I see it in the book, bold it, I put r with an arrow over it. But if I know that vector happens to be a unit vector, that's when I put the carrot on top, or the house top on the top of it. That emphasizes to me, and should tell you too, that indeed is a unit vector. And i, j, and k are always unit vectors. So that's why I put those caps on to keep it in my mind, but also make it very clear those are unit vectors. Okay. So, 
what it's set to do, there's your displacement vector, find the speed at time t equal two seconds of a particle whose position vector is that. So what would be the first thing we'd have to do? Take a derivative, sounds like a good answer. R prime of t, and this will give you your velocity, not necessarily speed. I'm going to write that down. That's your velocity vector is a time of t, and what would that be? Three t squared in the i direction e to the t in the j direction plus four in the k direction. Okay. Okay. Velocity is the vector quantity. It has direction. Speed is the magnitude of it. Okay. That's it. That's all. Just like displacement is a velocity vector, arc length is the magnitude of that, in a sense. Okay? All right. That's not quite equivalent, but it's awfully close to it. So, if we want to know the speed at time t equal uh, 2, okay, um, The, uh, it's just the, ma the, the magnitude of that vector there. And what is the magnitude? So the speed, which I'm going to put V of T, that's what they let represent speed. I don't like it as much, but that's what they do. This is equal to what? Of the these things squared, right. So that would be 3t squared squared plus uh, a minus e to the t squared plus 4 squared, right? That's the magnitude of the velocity vector. Oh, my goodness, my neck and my back are popping like crazy. I had a pretty busy weekend on the, uh, working and stuff. <laughs> I'm getting too old for that. <laughs> okay, so let's find out what those are. What is 3t squared squared? 9t to the fourth plus to the t to 2t okay plus 16 okay now that's at any time t we're wanting velocity at time 2 seconds if i yeah at 2 seconds okay so that be the square root of well 9 times what's t to the fourth power 2 to the fourth 16 plus e to the fourth plus 16. Okay, so that looks like 10 times 16 because you have 9 times 16 plus 1 times 16 would be 10 times 16. That's 160 plus e to the fourth. Okay. And you've got to take a square root of it. So it's the square root of 160 plus e to the fourth. Okay. Now, um, uh, sort of interesting here they never told us what the uh, they only told us time was in seconds okay they gave us position vector they gave us everything but at the end they said it's in feet per second they never told us what R was measured in so they must have been measured in feet 
If you got a calculator, I'd be interested to see what that. Do you have one on you? Okay, 160 plus, and you know how to do e to the fourth. Okay. Second. Okay, did you take the square root already? Yeah, and they got 14.65, yeah. Just want to make sure, because they didn't write out those numbers, I want to make sure we have the right numbers. All right, good deal. Now, as I sort of intimated before, the arc length is a fairly simple formula to put down. But to actually do calculations with it sometimes are horrendous because they may be functions you can't even integrate. Okay, easy to write them down, but if you can't integrate them, then you have difficulty. Now, another easy thing to do is to do what they call arc length parameterization, or at least it looks easy on the surface. Where you run into difficulty is. finding situations you can really use it, okay, uh, and use it precisely. They're not easy, I'll put it that way. Okay, I guess my eyes are stinging. Um, we have seen that parameterizations are not unique. For example, R1 of t could be t, t squared, that's a vector. R2 of u would be, could be u cubed, u to the sixth. They both parameterize the parabolas y is equal to x squared. All right, sorry. Notice that in this case, R2 is obtained by substituting t is equal to r cubed in r1. Okay? Maybe I should be writing these down. Okay? Here's your r1. t, t squared. Okay? Here's your r2, but of a different parameter. And that's equal u cubed u okay all right And they made the note here that the only difference between these two is that t is equal to u cubed. Because t squared would be u6. So they're basically talking about the same curves. You just have different parameters and you're doing different things to them. Okay? Same general. <coughs> now. I'm not really certain why they're saying that, but, but they are. It's certainly true. It's perfectly fine. In general, we obtain a new parameterization by making a substitution, say t is equal to g of u, uh, Trying to see in general we obtain a new parameterization by making a substitution. That is replacing R of T with a R1 of U 
which is equal to R of G of U. Okay? And that's what this figure is supposed to be showing here. So let's see if we can make that happen. It's uh Swelling up on me. Um, G is a function that maps S onto T. So T is equal to G of S. Okay? Now, S is goes from C to D, while T's are going from A to B. Okay? And they're mapped somehow there. And g of s0 will produce t0. Now we have another function, and this happens to be a vector function. That's a scalar function there. g operating on s to give you a t. Okay? But r is a vector function operating on t, okay, between a and b, and it's producing a curve in space. Okay? Because it's a vector function. Okay? Now, because R operates on T, but T is a function of G, you could say that R1 of S is R of G of S. So, where R operated just on T here to give you a, a vector function, R1 is also a vector function, but it operates on the g function to take you all the way back to the original uh, independent variable s. Okay? So r1 would go straight from s to capital R, I mean bold R. This is a vector, that's a vector. Okay? Now, it's all well and good, and the question is, so what? Okay, that's really what it almost seems like. The path is parameterized by R of T, but also by R1 of S, if R1 is R of G of S. Okay? So, R1 is a function, and let's just, by their choice of variables, And I'm not saying this is a fair thing to do or even an accurate thing to do, but they've been calling S an arc length, okay? Where T is just some parameter. And this is indicating that T is equal to G of S, okay? And then R of T is a function certainly of T, but it's also through R1 a function of S as well, or through G a function of S as well. And again, it's kind of uh, almost looks like much ado about nothing, but it's not quite. There is some something it's to do about. Let's see if we can do example three, and maybe it will bring light on it a little bit. Parameterize the path R of T, okay? And this R of T is this vector quantity, T squared, sine T, T. All right? For 3, T between 3 and 9. 3 is less than or equal to t is less than or equal to 9. So you're limited in your domain to that, domain for t. Now, it says parameterize that path using the parameter u, where t is equal to some g of u, and that g of u is equal to e to the u. Okay?
Now, I don't know if this is the first thing that comes to mind, and if it isn't, it's not a bad idea to cultivate it to, okay? Now we can rewrite this R of, and T is G of U, R of G of U, and that's equal to, okay, T squared. Well, T is G of U, which is E to the U, so this is E to the U. I'm sorry, I just said one thing and wrote another. Do you want to keep it in the same color? Huh? Yeah, okay. All right. I'll follow it, I think, as long as I can. I've got to go get something. Uh, I'm really feeling dizzy. Sorry, I don't know why. It happened yesterday a little earlier, and that, that, that's not what I wanted to do. Go back. Let me pause this just range. Okay. Now, oh. Now, I have to wait for that to come on. Should have pushed the button first thing. Let's see. The student was asking me a question. Here we go. Now, just a little bit of recap here. We have r as a function of t, t squared sine t, t, is that it? Yeah, example three. Okay, and we have t is a function of u. Goodness, that's one of weird things. And that is e to the u. So, what we do here is the r is a function of t, but t is g of u, which is e to the u. So, um, okay, t is e to the u, and here we have t squared, so that would be e to the u squared, right? Right? Okay, comma, sine of, what's t? e to the u. Okay, comma, and what's t? e to the u. Okay, now, you can clean that up just ever so slightly, and that would be e to the 2u, okay, comma, sine e to the u, not much you can do with that, comma, e to the u. So there's your r, and they this is what they call r1 as a function of u, okay? It's r as a function of t, but r1 is a function of u, okay? Now, I'm not sure they even say that, okay? And, and there they write it down, e to the 2u, sine e to the u, e to the u. Now, <clears throat> here we had our limits on t. We really need to put limits on u as well. All right? Well, how do we do that? Um, when t is 3, we need to figure out what u is. Well, that's not particularly handy here because this is t as a function of u. Oh, I thought you were going to come back. Okay. Trey is here. Okay. We haven't seen Victor in a while, so hopefully he'll get back here sometime soon. Okay. Now, to get limits for u, we need to get u as a function of t. This gives us t as a function of u, 
So how do we go the other way? How do we solve this for you? How do you undo an E function? What's the inverse function of E? Exponential. Oh, yeah. It's the log function, the natural log. Okay? Because E is the natural base for our number system, so the natural log undoes the, the base. So this implies that U is equal to the natural log of T. Now, sometimes you may have problems with that, especially if T were allowed to be negative, then you have to put absolute value forms. But T is between 3 and 9, all positive, so you don't need to put that. So, now we have our limits for U, okay? So, well, I mean, you have U as a function of T, now we can put in the values there and see that when t is 3 then u is log 3 and when t is 9 u is log 9 okay so there we have the function completely written that way and they sure enough call it r1 of u okay now, one way of parameterizing a path is to choose the starting point and walk along the path at unit speed, say at one meter per second. A parameterization of that type is called an arc length parameterization. Okay? And here is the characteristic of it. If the magnitude of R prime of T is equal to 1 for all t, then that is a arc length parameter relation. It's defined by the property that the speed is a constant value of 1, which is kind of weird restriction, okay? You've imposed something that's rather bizarre on there, okay? Now, this next slide is meant to kind of give you a visual about what they're talking about there. Okay? Here's the origin. I didn't draw, draw the coordinate system, but here's the origin. And here is your arc length. S is moving along like this. It just keeps on coming. Now, in terms of S, where S is arc length, if this is going at a constant speed, then your dsd, whatever your independent variable is, is 1, and that's 1, and this is 1, and that's 1, and that one. The directions are changing like crazy if the magnitude is staying the same. That's an arc length parameterization, which I guess the word I was trying to think of earlier, it feels artificial to me feels like you just impose it on it and you say, why? You know, but Now, this is not an arc length parameterization. Okay? This is R as a function of T. It can be a very large velocity there, a much smaller velocity here, much smaller, uh, larger than this, but less than that. Something about the same to change direction, then slowing down again. There your velocity vectors are much smaller. Now, notice here, this is a very large velocity, so notice how far you went in that first time interval, or whatever interval you got. This is a much smaller, so you went a much smaller distance here. This one's in between, so you went an intermediate frame, and this one and this one are about the same, because it looks like your lengths are about the same. This one might be a little bit longer, and this one's shorter, so I would expect T5 to be, T equal 5 to be somewhere there. Whereas on this one, all your arc lengths are the same between the intervals because your arc length parameterization has a speed of 1. So you all have one single arc length uh, travel in that time. Okay? And again, it seems artificial. Okay? But it makes calculations really nice if that's true. 
but it still seems pretty artificial. Okay. Now, um, because we use the symbol S to represent arc length, then therefore we usually use an arc length parameterization, the independent variable S. And since T is typically not have anything to do with arc length parameterization, when you see a T, you can usually figure that is not an arc length parameterization. Okay? Now, earlier they did one down here on the bottom of the previous page. They had that's equal one, so that would be one. Okay? But most of the time they'll use S when it's arc length parameterization. All right. Now, The arc length parameterization is also sometimes called the unit speed parameterization, which frankly, that's a little more precise meaning to me, and you still say, why do it? But at least that makes more sense. Whereas arc length parameterization, you just because of arc length, you don't see a real reason why it should be the same in any given time interval. But that's how they define it. Okay. So how do you go about finding that arc length parameterization? Uh, okay. They have a couple of formulas here. And you have to be careful when you're reading these. Okay. Oops, that's the last slide they have, so we better do all the writing on here. Now, in an arc length parameterization, the distance traveled over any time interval is equal to the length of that time interval. It is equal to the length of the interval. Yeah, because your speed is 1. Okay. So the distance traveled... Okay, uh, over A, B, interval A to B, B, and these are measured in, okay, um, these are values for T, you know, all right, so that distance traveled, the definition of that from before, same as your arc length, is the integral from A to B of the magnitude of your R prime of T, dt. Okay? Now, if that is an arc length parameterization, like we had at the bottom of the last one, if that is, if that R prime of T is an arc length parameterization, then that speed is 1. So then you have the integral from A to B of dt. Okay? If that speed, if this thing is 1, then that's just a 1 there. And then this would be t, value of A to B, that would be B minus A. So that means for every interval you travel, you go, if the speed's 1, if the length that you traveled is B minus A, then that's how long it took you to get. I mean, that's, you know, that's the distance trap. Well, of course it is. If that's, you know, uh, if your speed was 1 and you went from A to B at a speed of 1, then whatever the distance is from B to A, that's how far you traveled. Okay. It's sort of a duh. Okay. Now, how do we go about finding the arc length parameterization? Start with any parameterization. Now, that one we would have been calling R of S, okay? But they called it R of T, but they said it was arc length parameterization. Now we're going to start with the R of T, whose first derivative, uh, any old parameterization, R of T. Okay? Not necessarily an arc length parameterization. Okay? Now, the only requirement here is that the R prime of T is not equal to zero. 
In other words, your velocity isn't stopped anywhere along here. You're always moving, okay? Okay. That's for all t. So basically that means if you start out at a positive velocity, you're going to stay at a positive velocity because to get to a negative velocity, you have at some point there you go to zero velocity, okay? You can't do that. Or if you start at a negative velocity, you have to stay at a negative velocity. You can't go to positive because there's zero across here. So this would mean r prime, not zero. Okay, well you can't go negative velocity. Yeah, if you're moving backwards. Well, well okay, I guess yeah. the direction wise, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Negative speed, no. no negative no, velocity, no, yes. No, no, yeah, right. Yeah. Negative speed, no. Uh, but negative velocity, yes. You could. Most of the time we don't. But, uh, there was a guy who played on a high school basketball team that was a year ahead of us. We had this really excellent basketball coach. But he was one strict guy. And Phil Chalker was the center on the team, and he was a really good player. Uh, but he had some knee and ankle issues. He was sort of tall, and he had injured himself a time or two. So he did, so he was sometimes a little slower getting out of the dressing room because of his braces and, yeah. you know, the things he put on for support. And the coach was a little put out with him one day. He said, Phil, we're waiting on you. And <laughs> Phil was crazy. He said, well, then you must be moving backwards. <laughs> and we all just, oh. he said that to Coach Brandon, and Coach Brandon just laughed. Because uh, he hadn't expected anything like this. No one ever talked back to Coach Brandon. So <laughs> Phil got away with it. So he was moving backwards because he was waiting on the other. Okay, that's beside the point. So we start with any parameterization, R of t, not necessarily arc length. You form the arc length interval. Okay, well, how do you do that? From what we did before, S is equal to. And they put this in here, and I'm not sure why. You don't, I don't think, need that step in there. But this is, I guess you do, just to see it's a function of t. Zero to t of the absolute value r prime of u du. Okay? That's your definition for r. Okay? We did that at the very beginning today. That's your definition. Okay. Now, what they're saying here is that this S is a function of time. Because rather than A to B, you put 0 to T. That made it a function of T. When you did that, you, since you're using T here, you use the dummy variable U or anything else other than the variable you've already used. Okay, so that's the first thing. Step two. Because this thing is not equal to zero, that's what we said here, okay? Uh, the S of G of T is an increasing function, okay? Now, I said it could be positive or negative. Mm -hmm. They're saying it's positive, which is sort of what you indicated, but indeed it is. They're, they're keeping this positive. It's an increasing function. The S is always increasing. Well, if you're moving in the forward direction, then your arc length is always increasing. If you're not allowed to go backward or even stop, then in time, you're always, if that can't be zero, then you're never going to be the same. It's always going to be greater. Okay? So that's making sense. Okay? Um, increasing function and therefore it has an inverse okay because s strictly increasing remember an inverse function cannot back up on itself because it wouldn't have an inverse so it has to be strictly increasing monotonically increasing or monotonically decreasing we have chosen increasing here so this s is an increasing function so if it's increasing it has an inverse now, calculating it may be hard to do, but it does have an inverse, okay? And that inverse function is, and this is why they introduced this g, that t would equal to the inverse of g 
of s, okay? It has to have an inverse function. That's why they named it g, so you could indicate it's an inverse function. Now, take the new parameterization, r1 of s, because r was a function of t, but do r of s, okay, r1 of s, and have that to be uh, r of inverse g of s, okay? Because you take r of t, remember, but if t is inverse function of s, then substitute the t there for that, and sure enough, you have come up with, this is an arc length parameterization, this was that and this, okay? Now, in most cases, here's the key, in most cases we cannot evaluate the arc length interval s is equal g of t explicitly. You, it's very rare you can come up with that. I said this earlier when Jasmine was here. Very rare you can come up with something, some formula, some displacement function that when you take a derivative of it, and then you take the magnitude of that derivative, which is the square root of x prime of t plus y prime of t, so wait, x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared plus z prime of t squared, and under a square root, and have a function you can integrate. Yeah, good luck with that. There are some, but they're few and far between, okay? Most of the time, that is such a convoluted thing by the time you take a derivative of each of the components, square them, add them together, and then take a square root of that. Yeah, good luck with integrating something that complicated. Explicitly. Most of the time, you can't, okay? Um, now, we cannot find the formula for the inverse g prime. Just because this is an increasing function doesn't mean its inverse is going to be something easy to come up with. If it is, fine, fantastic. But most of the time, that's going to be a very difficult step. Theoretically, it exists. Finding it may be really, really hard. Okay. Uh, so although the arc length parameterizations exist in general, we can find them explicitly only in a few special cases. Most of the time you wind up doing numerical integration or something like that because most of the time they're not very user-friendly at all. So here's one they have found that's good. So since I can't go anywhere else, I'm sorry, I hit the wrong key. Uh, no, 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 no. It always does that. I don't want to do that. Okay, did the same thing, but it was a lot more clicks to do it. Find the arc length parameterization of the helix. And now I have to go back and get my pen back. Okay. R of t is equal to cosine 4t sine 4t 3t. Now this is almost just like one that we did earlier. Not quite, but close enough. And you can see you have to have rather strange things like this to get them to work. Okay, so what was your step one? Form the arc length integral. What was it? the arc length? It's equal to the integral, and this is a function of t, from 0 to t, and let's see, did they give you any limits? I don't think they did, so we'll do 0 to t, and it's the square root, and I'll write it out, absolute value r prime of t. That's what your arc length parameter is, okay, dt. And I explained it this way, this helped me to remember. If you think of this as a velocity function, so the 
absolute value rather than as a speed function, right? Okay. And speed times time is distance. Yeah. So that's the arc. But that's how fast you're moving along the curve. And the dt is the increment you're moving along the curve in time. So this is how far you go as a function of time. Okay, except, I'm sorry, I've got one thing wrong there. If you put t on the integral, you have to use u's here. So, sorry. Or something else. It just can't be t. Okay. Um, oh my goodness, didn't they do it? <laughs> they went through all the thing of saying that. You don't have your book with you. You don't even use this book. They put T's in there, just like I did, and just pretended it was okay. <laughs> If you're going to have T up there, you need to have something else in there. It doesn't really matter, because we can, that's just a dummy inside anyway, but to get S of T. But anyway, let's go with this, do it this way. All right, so what we have to do then is find R prime of T. And then we can change it U if we want to. What would that be? That would be negative sine, that would be negative or sine or T. Got it, comma. Comma, three. Okay. Now, the magnitude of that would be the square root of those things squared. Okay. So this would be the integral zero to t of the square root of sine four t squared. And what would that be? Just square that. Well, 16 sine 16t. Sine squared. Yeah, sine squared. 16. No, 4t. You don't square the argument. You square the function, not the argument of the function. The number in front, you square that too. If you're squaring okay, Pythagorean theorem, okay, you have sine t cosine t cosine t, all those yeah. things. And the Pythagorean theorem says that sine squared t plus cosine squared t is equal to 1, right? Yeah. Okay, you don't see sine squared of t squared. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you don't yeah. square the argument, you just square the function. Okay. And so that's the first one. Plus? Oh, uh, plus uh, 16 cosine 4t. Cosine squared 4t. Yeah, squared. Okay, plus? Plus 9. 9, okay dt. All right? Uh, it's du, actually, and these should be used too, but we're not going to fuss about that. Okay, so this will be the integral from 0 to t of now. Ew, this one's far worse than, than before. Yuck. The last time they had the same argument with, if they had 4t, 4t, the last one would have been a 4t, too. Now it isn't. It's a big boo hiss. But what we want to happen is before we do anything else, what I'm going to do is divide everything on in here by 9. Okay? Okay. Square root of 9, right? If I do that, then I have to multiply everything by the square root of 9, too, right? The square root of 9 is 3. So that brings a 3 on the outside. Okay. okay. Yeah, you don't sound very convinced, do you? Okay. All right. Now, I'm not sure that's necessary. Nah, it's probably not. We'll do it later. But since you looked a little skeptical, I won't do that yet, okay? Because I don't think it's necessary yet. We'll, we're going to wind up doing it in a minute any, or doing something equivalent to it. So here's what I'm going to do now, okay? What is these two together?
1. So that's going to be 16, isn't it? So it is 16? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Because you can factor out a 16 and have sine squared 4t yeah, plus yeah, cosine yeah. squared 14, 4t, or for you or whatever it is, and that's going to be 1, and then you'll have 16 times 1. Yeah, okay. So what you have is the square root of 16 plus 9. Okay. Okay. D, whatever you want to call it, I'll keep it U. But what is square root of 16 plus 9? What is 16 plus 9? Yes, you do. 16 plus 9. Twenty-five, yeah. Okay. And what's square root of twenty-five? Five. So this is five times uh, t. Okay. Because the integral is, if you pull the five on the outside, it's the integral from zero to t du, and that would just be u du evaluated from t to zero. That'd be 5t minus 5 times 0. So that's 5t. Uh, one question before we yeah. move on. I just want to make sure something. So, just in the future. So, as you can see, it says sine squared to the 14, right? Right. Well, 4u, actually. Right. And cosine to the 4u. Right. Square here. So, even though we said that. It was this. Stuff like this is what confuses me a little bit in the future. So ten. You said that is one correct though. Even though it has a fourteen in the middle of the function. Let me suggest something to you. Why don't we make a substitution? Substitution. Okay. Sure. Let's say 4t is equal to theta. Okay. What would you have there? <laughs> uh, just have just sine squared theta and cosine plus cosine squared there. And what's that? Just one. Why? Wow. Yeah. No doubt. So yeah, it, it doesn't matter that the argument is, as long as the argument's the same, that's all it's required. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good point. Derivatives. You know, they, that enters in the picture there, but yeah, otherwise. So what we have, that comes out to be 5t. So there we have s as a function of t is 5t. So that's a pretty nice s of t is equal to 5t. I think I can come up with an inverse function of that. Uh, what were we calling it before? t is equal to s over 5. That's your G inverse function. Okay? Now, your, let's see. <laughs> uh, how, how, how did you get S over 5? How did I get what? Yeah, I don't understand the inverse thing you just did a few seconds ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. This is S is function of t and 5t. Yes. Okay. If I want to, and that's an increasing function, the t, right? Yes. Close to 5. Okay, if I want to get the inverse function of that, I solve this for t. Multiply the S by 5. And that gives you t is S over 5. So now t is a function of S. Uh, okay. No. All right, it's I real easy when it's a linear. If it wasn't linear, it's going to get a lot hairier. But this one's pretty easy. Okay? It, it almost seems too easy, but that's why they did it. They wanted it to be really easy. Okay? So now we found their inverse function. Okay? That was step two. Okay? Now we substitute that back in for what we started with. T is equal to S over 5. So let's go back to our R of T and plug in, and that's going to make a, our 1 of S, okay? If we plug in this, so this one would be 
r of t was cosine of 4t, but t was s over 5, so that's 4 fifths s. You see that? We're plugging t equal s over 5 in to that r of t at the top. So it's cosine of 4 times s over 5. So that would be 4 fifths s. Right? Okay. Comma. Give me the next one. Four over five S, yes. comma. And then three times four over five. Three S. fifths S, right? Yes. Okay. All right. There's your R one of S. That is a arc length parameterization. Of the same function we had before, we just made that arc length parameterization. Okay? And if you wanted to, okay, you could take the magnitude, take the derivative of this, the magnitude of that, and see what you get. What should you get? The arc length parameterization. The speed is. One. That's the key. That's what makes an arc length parameterization. The speed is always one. Well, let's see. We'll first do R1 of S prime. That would be? Oh, on the uh, negative sign of four, you know, four With the four fifths up front, right? Yes. Okay. Comma. Uh, four fifths cosine of four over five s. Okay. Comma. And uh, three over five. Okay. Three over five. Okay. That one you do that good root of that. Okay. All right. Now to get the magnitude, we do the square root of this one squared, which would be. 16 25ths minus sign minus is plus, so you lose that, right? Yeah. Sine squared 4 fifths s plus 16 over 25 cosine squared 4 fifths s plus 9 25ths. You buy it? Okay, and again, we can factor out the 16 25ths, and then sine squared this plus cosine squared that is 1, plus 9 25ths, and what do we have? 1, so the speed is 1, absolutely. So that is indeed an arc length parameterization. All right, is it time? Oh my goodness, it is time. Okay, um, and we did finish, okay? In fact, they did the same thing we did. They did the R prime. I didn't know they were going to. So, do you want to do preliminary questions next time or just skip them? It's up to you. Skip them, okay. Well, we, either way. Homework exercises, any of the odds, one through seven. Do number nine. Any of the odds 11 through 15, any of the odds 17 through, whoa, 37, okay? And then we'll be ready to do curvature next time, okay? And by the way, there's something there mentioned about Mernoulli's spiral. I think I mentioned this last time, did I? I believe I did, or not. Okay, uh, you can write it, you can use that as a paper topic, you can write on any of the Bernoullis, I don't know which one came up with this spiral, there was two brothers, Jacob and Johann, 
And then, oh, yeah. yeah, one of them had some sons, and one of them was Daniel. And then there were a bunch of others. There were just nephews and sons and fathers and brothers and arguments. <laughs> I mean, they were a, a brilliant family, but not very functional. <laughs> <laughs> somewhat dysfunctional. But you can write on any of them. You can write on the Bernoulli spiral, how they developed it, whichever one developed it, uh, what's it's used for, or what's an application of it, anything such as that. Anything else that you see. Okay? So we'll pick up next time with curvature, 13.4. All right, good deal. Any questions? All right, we'll go on.